the right button. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> All right, so um, what's exciting this week is that school's beginning, right? You guys are praying and excited for students getting to go back to school, many in the classroom, some online. Um, the school that I work at, um, we start school on Wednesday. And so uh, Tuesday night, we have our back to school night, kind of an open house time with students, and then we're ready to go at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. And I know this one question is gonna get asked to me over 100 times this year, <laughs> like it does every single year, and it's, how come God doesn't move like he did now as he did in the Bible? Right? You've, you've maybe asked that question a couple times and then started to give up on that question, maybe? I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a good question. It's a valid question, and I want to play with it a little bit today because um, I know I'll be playing with it all year. <laughs> So the scripture that um, we're going to dive into, the little intro of what happens before this, because context is important, right, is the feeding of the 5,000. Now in the Gospels, our four Gospels, there's these stories of Jesus, and they all have Jesus' death and resurrection, but the one other story that all four tell is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. There's also a feeding of the 4,000, um, but the feeding of the 5,000 is a significant uh, miracle that takes place. And I'm not preaching on that one, but I, I do want to point out that there was more than 5,000 people. It means that there was 5,000 men there, because that's how they counted in their, their Hebrew culture, which means there was women and children as well. There was more than 5,000 people that gathered. And... Uh, the disciples, if you remember, are like, Jesus, send these people away. They're going to be hungry. Let them go off and find some food somewhere. And Jesus' response to them was, you feed them. You, you do it. You feed them. And all they had was some fish and some loaves. And a miracle happened. Why doesn't God move like he did back in the Bible? Well, we're going to look more at that. So our story today, what happens just after that um, is Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, and it's an account that you're probably familiar with. And it reads, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they crossed over, they landed in Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all of their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. All right. That should sound a little familiar to you, actually, if you... Uh paid attention last week. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word and um, how much that uh, your spirit is not just um, poured into it, but your spirit is just constantly pouring out of it. And so Father, may we um, meet you here and, um, and see what it is that you are doing 
uh, in our lives, what you've done in this past week and how you've prepared us for this week to come. So Father, may we gather here together in your name and your heart. And may we be still for a moment to hear from you. We love you and thank you in your name. Amen. So we're going to do the thing that I always love to do where we just go down through the story and we grab observations and ask some questions, right? Um, I, I think that's the great way in which we, we, we learn and we study. And um, your different translations will, will word things um, differently. So your Bible might say that um, the time when Jesus walked out onto the water was um, the fourth watch of the night. Now, the, this one here said he came out at dawn, right? But most of your Bibles will say fourth watch of the night. And we would, might want to say, what is the fourth watch of the night and why is that important? Um, and so the fourth watch of the night is technically between 3 and 6 a.m. Because after 6 a.m., it's considered morning. Um, so we know that Jesus, maybe he took a nap but maybe he didn't. And he's a night owl as well. <laughs> we know he gets up early to pray. Guess what? He stays up late as well. Um, and so from three to six in the morning is about that time when this happens. And in Hebrew culture, that's a significant time because the understanding is that it's in that time that God will give us visions and get, um, dreams. Um, the, the vision and dream that um, Paul receives when he is trying to uh, travel into um, Maasai, uh, they believe it was, it was the fortnight. That was the time when he realized that he had a vision, that he was really called to go to Macedonia with Silas and Timothy. Um, when Joseph had his dream that um, he was to marry Mary and that God was doing something there, he got up immediately and went to go claim her. Um, and begin the path that God had for him. And so this is a time that's very special um, in consideration for them, uh, that it's this time where God's looking to communicate. He's looking to still do something. Um, so another question maybe to ask is, and I always thought this was interesting, why do they think it's a ghost on the water? Like, why do they think that? Um, and so, again, context is important. This sea is the same sea where Jesus cast out um, the legion of demons out of that guy over by the tombs. And it went into the pigs, and the pigs ran and drowned themselves in the sea. This is that body of water. And I actually didn't notice this until like I was just now reading this. Where he's going to is that place. He's going over to the Gentile side. Um, that Gezerah is the city. Um, there's two little cities right there, and those are the cities where that story took place. And if you remember, Jesus casts the legion of demons out of the guy, and um, they run down and drown themselves in the body of water. And then the townsfolk are terrified, and they tell Jesus to go. Leave, leave, oh my goodness, right? So he leaves, and then remember that, that what happens after that is the story that we talked about last week, right? He goes to, he gets to the other side and there is um, uh, Jairus who's like, hey, can you heal my daughter? And along the way, the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years touches his cloak and we ask the question, where did she get the idea that if she touched his cloak, she would be healed? You know, I'm like that, that happens somewhere else. Where is that? So he then heals her, raises the little 12-year-old girl from the dead, and now, and then he's going to feed the 5,000, and now he's crossing back over to the, the Gentile side where the, um, the, the city where they had told him to go. Those are the people now who are saying, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we're so excited you're here, and they're now all touching his cloak. They probably just heard about the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. Huh, that's interesting. I love that. All right. So here's a bit. Why do they think that it was a ghost? So if you were the disciples, you're a pack of teenage boys, and your rabbi cast the demons out of the guy into the pigs, and the pigs drown themselves in the water, would you be kind of scared of the water? That 
would be kind of scary, right? So it's the middle of the night, and you're crossing back up, like, dude, do you remember last time we were on this body of water? Oh my gosh. And then this thing is like walking towards you, like, oh, they're looking for us. You know what I mean? You can kind of understand some of that fear that might be taking, that seems like logical thinking, I guess. Um, but also, um, the Hebrew culture, they have this concept um, that there is something mysterious and perhaps even sinister lurking beneath the water. That's a, um, a common Hebrew uh, concept. We see that in Revelation a lot, like the depths of the sea and scary things rise up out of the depths of the sea. And um, I actually really love this, but in um, Genesis chapter one, where it says that God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit of God hovered over the water, that word for water you know what you can directly translate it as? Chaos. So when God created the heavens and the earth, the Spirit of God hovered over the chaos. And we know that he created order and light over all the chaos. And um, one of the reasons why I love that concept that it's it's not just the water, it's the chaos. Is I think, oh, is Lucifer's rebellion taking place right then? Because God knows what he's going to do with that, right? And he's going to use it to redeem us all, right? So um, I, I, I do find that um, not just poetic, but sincerely beautiful and all of that. So they're terrified. They think it's a ghost. And if that's the case, we have to ask this question. Okay, if you were Peter's <clears throat> brother or friends and you were terrified that it's a ghost, and now Peter's trying to jump ship. Wouldn't you try to stop him? Like, no one tries to talk him out of it. They're, they're not convinced it's Jesus. They're like, no, Peter, it's a ghost. He's trying to enchant you. Stop. And literally, okay, like Andrew, his brother, 10 bucks. This guy's like, oh, yeah, he's just like that. He doesn't look before he leaves. Tell me about it. You call that crazy? I call this Tuesday. <laughs> Peter's brother. You know, I'm not trying to stop him. Um, that scene doesn't happen, and that's kind of funny to me. Like, why is, why are they not trying to stop him? Um, <laughs> and so, uh, oh, so even if we're, like, we are long past, you know, being in the seventh grade, right? We're still asking that question. How come these things don't happen, um, nowadays like they did in the Bible? And so, uh, Jesus does, he comes out walking, up, walking down the water, and a scene that also doesn't happen here is this, okay? No one's trying to get Peter to not go. Some of them are like, would you just hurry up and jump? Oh my gosh. But what also doesn't happen is Peter doesn't yell, hey, Jesus, I know that can't be you, because if it were you, you would part these waters. That doesn't happen. Um, he doesn't start yelling, you know, because like Moses parts the water with his staff and Joshua parts the Jordan with an ark and Elijah parts it with his cloak and then Elisha takes his cloak and parts it again. In the Old Testament, God parts the water. He doesn't walk on it. That didn't happen. That's actually kind of surprising to me. Because aren't we sort of like that? Don't we tell God he, he wouldn't or couldn't or shouldn't do that because that didn't play out like that? Someone's saying, God's moving and he's calling me to do this. And you're like, really? You know, I think the thing that we all need to be doing is drawing closer to the character and the heart of God that we have the discernment when he's moving and something consistent to his character as he's going to call us to do things that might make us look a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> so if you haven't noticed that the disciples never ask, hey Jesus, why doesn't God move like he did in the Old Testament? They don't ask that question. Why isn't he moving like he did in the Old Testament? They're fascinated by how Jesus is moving. It's challenging, it's scary, but they're going with it and they're on board for the most part. 
he doesn't move in the New Testament like he does in the Old. Um, there, there are crossovers, right? There's resurrections, there's healings, um, and God does do a lot of, but a lot of what he does is actually new. He's doing new things. Uh, when he feeds the 4,000, when he feeds the 5,000, it's not manna from heaven. It's not the widow's oil. Now it's multiplica- multiplication by participation. People who have shown up As they are breaking bread, the supplies multiply, and they end up with more than what they started. That's not how the food worked (laughs) in the Old Testament when God performed a miracle. He just wasn't doing everything the same way. And all of this, of course, uh, that God doesn't move like he did in the Bible is just sometimes us being hung up on miracles or plagues. But let's look at this. Is God moving like he did in the Bible? Well, does he comfort the broken still? Yeah, he does. Does he still heal? Yes, he does. Does he give sight to the blind? Yes, he does. Does he humble the proud? Yeah, he does. And are there still miracles, miraculous things? Yes. I absolutely believe in miracles. (laughs) I do think they still happen. I think that they can look different. But they still happen. Nonetheless, Peter doesn't say to Jesus, you can't be from God because he would part the water and not walk in it. Why doesn't God move like he did in the Old Testament? But instead, he says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, I really want to know what he was thinking with that. Because if it was me, I'd be like, Jesus, if it's you, tell me what I ate for breakfast. <laughs> I, that, that makes more sense to me. I mean, really? Right, right. Tell me what I ate for breakfast. That's where I'd be not, let's put my life in danger for funsies. Right? But no, it's Peter, right? That's where he's going with it. Um, so the question is, where are you with that? If Jesus came walking out to you on the water and you were not sure it's him, would you ask him to prove himself by him doing something or by you doing something he has enabled you to do. And that is something has a risk on your part. Let's be honest with that. (laughs) Would you ask him to prove himself or say, call me to do something daring? I'm in. Enable me, Lord. Following Jesus is not comfortable, but you will be comforted. He's going to call you out of your comfort zone. Um, <laughs> there's this uh, book out that's called, um, my friend was reading it, and I have not read the book, but he was telling me all about it. And um, he was doing it with his Bible class at the school, and it was about, uh, question if you're a fan of Jesus or a follower of Jesus. And it's really interesting because here's how they break down a fan. A fan is someone who shows up to the feeding of the 5,000. They show up, a crowd attracts a crowd, um, they get fed, they get healed, they get comforted. They love the energy and the worship and the message. Uh, but the problem is they're just fans. Uh, they see the crowd and they join it. If you show up to a little league game, and you see like the one giant cheering crowd and then you see the team that has like less. Do you show up and think, wow, that other team must be really, really good and they've got all the energy and something good's going on there and I should be, I, I should go over there and join that crowd. It's kind of fun, right? And we don't stop to think, who needs encouragement? <laughs> what team should I go to? If there's a sport that you're picking to, um, uh, 
get into and pick a team that you're a fan of? Do you pick a team that already has a really big following or you decide, you know what, I don't follow sports, so I don't know who's on a major losing streak right now. But would you just randomly say, I pick them, you know? That's who I want to go cheer for. Um, Brad uh, was saying last week about, because we all know he loves the Seahawks, right? And he is uh, like, you know, there's those of us who are hardcore fans, you know? Even when they're losing or on a losing streak, we're in it with them. And then there's those people who only show up when they're winning. Right? That you like, you know, <laughs> and like, oh yeah, he's t that's because I think Brad is more than a fan, right? He's he's more of a follower, right? So follower, um, a follower is someone who's not necessarily looking for the crowd. They look for the broken, the lonely, the small towns, or those living in alleyways and cities. They look for those who are overlooked. They seek out where there's darkness and brokenness and despair so that they can go be a light in a dark place. And I hope that as I was describing that, um, God was moving in your mind maybe the names of some people who need a call this week, who need a visit, that might feel forgotten, right? Followers go to those places. Um, Follow, uh, the followers, they're the ones who end up being um, the missionaries. They're like, where does God's light need to be shed? Because that's where I'm going, right? Um, they didn't show up to get fed. They showed up to feed others. And in doing that, they are fed too. I think that's the scary part. When we know that we are not perfect, we are broken people too. We are hungry. We need people to pray for us. We have needs as well. But sometimes we forget that if we go out to care in that degree for other people, we find where God is turning around to heal us in those very places. Followers see where there, where there is a need and they become generous and to the point that they are uncomfortable. The book of Acts is actually written for you to read in one sitting. Well, all the letters actually are, and that's traditionally how they were. And when we come to church, we're all like, we're reading one story, and then <laughs> we talk on one story. That's not how uh, it's actually designed to be um, read and understood. And I was in one of my classes that was specifically on the book of Acts, and my prof was like, you need to, this is your assignment this weekend, is carve out some time, sit down, put on a pot of coffee and you read the entire book of Acts and you do not get up. Do not go to the bathroom. Read the entire thing in one sitting. Don't move. And then tell me what you find. It was amazing. I, I recommend this week, do that. <laughs> try, you can go to the bathroom. I'll let you do that, all right? But uh, try to read the entire book of Acts in one sitting and see what is revealed to you? It's really interesting. Um, and how much you see that um, all of our apostles, our disciples, they are uncomfortable and they're constantly being comforted along the way. Every time they go to care for someone's need or find someone who's bro broken, God turns around and provides. So if you're hungry, go feed someone. If you're in need, go be generous. The disciples weren't just going in there looking for synagogues to be comfortable in. They looked for alleyways because that's what Jesus did. They wandered into small towns because that's what Jesus did. In major cities, they wandered down the streets where the blind beggars were because that's where Jesus wandered down. When they went outside the cities, they went out to go find the lepers because that's what Jesus did. They were followers, not fans. They didn't stick around while it was comfortable and good. Um, they went out and were, like, were willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of others. So you know who in your week might need some type of being fed or visited or encouraged or their yard weeded. And you might be sitting there saying, you just described me. Okay, my yard does need to get weeded. <laughs> 
you know, I, so you're like, I, I, I have to take care of some of the things that I have going on um, as well. But here's what's beautiful when you're reading the book of Acts is that everyone is caring for everyone's needs. And that community, people see that and they're like, what is that about? Because they're seeing the culture of heaven played out before their eyes. So are you comfortable here at Clam and Nazarene? The answer should be no. <laughs> the answer should be no, I'm not comfortable because I have come to be challenged. I've come to be out of my comfort zone. I won't live in my comfort zone. I won't be comfortable. I, I will not be comfortable like Clam and Nazarene. I will be uncomfortable. Um, I told Robin I was going to talk about her today. <laughs> she said this last week, and I loved it. Um, she said that she was for a really long time here serving in the nursery. And then she changed over and she started serving in the kitchen. And then church seems to have um, a break of our regular functions, right? Because of COVID. And she said, I want to try serving somewhere else. Oh my goodness, I think that's so cool. Because God is doing something new. As we start kicking off and moving forward, you don't necessarily have to come back and fulfill what your role was here before. Be uncomfortable. Try something new. Monday to Saturday. How are you going to go be uncomfortable at some point? <laughs> I, I love when we get updates on Paul because um, Paul uh, had uh, messaged my dad, was it on the Klamma board, that he just met two boys in it, um, from engineering, and he said, pray for them. He, he's stepping out on the campus, meeting college students, learning their stories, and sharing the gospel with them. He's being uncomfortable for Christ. And in that, he's being filled. Remember, we talked last week about, you know, when the woman had been bleeding for 12 years and she touched Jesus, Jesus felt the power go out of them. That when we go and we lay ourselves down to be there for other people, the power does not drain out of you. The power pours in. He fills us back up when, we're, when we feel like we have nothing left to offer. So at the end of the story, uh, you know, I had read it said that Jesus uh, crosses back over and everybody wants to touch his cloak. And, uh, and I was going to be like, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to point out that, yeah, that's where, like the lady touched his cloak and now everyone's excited about it. And I hadn't realized till, you know, it was up there that, oh, that was the same town where he cast the demons out of that guy. That's pretty cool because I was wondering what ever happened to that town. Well, no, there you go. I had to put that one together. Um. But something that comes to mind with that for me is um, that in the Old Testament, do you remember the story in Numbers 21 about the bronze snake on the pole, right? The disciple, the, the, the Israelites are all getting bit by snakes, and God's like, okay, Moses, make this bronze, great, bronze <laughs> snake, craft it, put it on a pole. When people look at it and believe that I have a heart to heal them, they're going to be healed. Well, the bronze snake is not showing up in New Testament. That's because Josiah had it uh, destroyed because people started worshiping it like an idol later. But anyways, that was a good move on his part. Um, but uh, now it's Jesus' prayer shawl, right? We go from an Old Testament bronze snake to a New Testament prayer shawl. What is God using today? Right? He parts waters in the Old Testament. He walks on them, walks on them in the New Testament. What is he doing now? Because he's doing nothing is not the right answer. We can't make an assumption like that. It's just going to be looking a little bit different. So Jesus asks Peter this question. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Um, I grew up in Sunday school and youth group and the little moral of the story that I grew up being told was, oh, well, he took his eyes off Jesus. And because he did that, 
he, uh, he kind of fell in his faith for the moment, and he was doubting that Jesus could do something about it. And I thought, oh, okay. But when I look closer at it, that is not at all what's happening here. That is not at all what's going on here. Because here's the argument. Peter told Jesus to call him onto the water. He picked that. I would say, what did I have for breakfast? But he picked that. <laughs> That's amazing. So um, a, a rabbi, when he asked a disciple to follow him, the concept and word of a disciple actually means to be so close behind your rabbi that the dust from his feet kick up and get onto your cloak in front of you. You're that close following him. And anything your rabbi does, you can do as well. So if your rabbi can walk on water, guess what? You can too. So Peter's question is not really that crazy. If he can do it, he's enabling me to do it too. And so just calling that out, wow, there's a huge mark of faith. And he's willing to be daring and uncomfortable for it. Knowing the depths of the water is kind of a scary thing even. And the big zinger is when, G when Peter starts to sink, who does he cry out for to save him? Jesus. If I was sinking, I wouldn't yell for someone I don't think can save me to save me. <laughs> I'm going to yell for the one who I know can save me, which means Peter, 100%, had faith that Jesus could pull him out. Otherwise, you wouldn't yell for Jesus to save you. So when Jesus asked, why did you doubt? You have little faith. Who did Peter actually doubt? It was himself. He doubted himself. And I'm sure what Jesus wanted to just yell is, are you kidding me right now? Peter, you're amazing. I made you amazing. How can you not see that? Let me tell you, he's saying that to you right now. This story is not about us growing in our faith in Jesus. It's God saying, I have faith in you. Do we realize that? Like, we're so caught on this concept of, oh, Lord, my faith needs to be challenged, and my faith is so weak, and Lord, help me with my faith. And God's like, can we step back, and I can just tell you about my beautiful faith that I have in you. The God of the universe who created you has faith in you. It's a reverse thing that's going on here, because context is everything. What was the story just before? The feeding of the 5,000. He said, you feed them. You do it. Because God has faith in his people. Now, he's not called you out to go alone. But he's got faith in you. It's kind of shocking to wrap your head around that sometimes. <laughs> and it's not meant in any way to make you arrogant and be like, oh, ho, I'm pretty awesome. That's right. No, he's calling you out to things that will make you feel like you're in over your head. And you should probably feel a little bit to that degree, like, whoo, Jesus, I would not have gone through that, gotten through all of that without you. The wind and the waves, they were pretty big. Not as big as you. So in both of these accounts, they're not about our faith in God. They are about God's faith in you. They're about God's faith in us. God is showing up and he's calling us to show up too. He's calling us out of that boat. And when we wonder why things don't happen today like they did in the Bible, it might be because we've lost an awful lot of faith in ourselves. Now, that's a tricky thing to try and think through because you, you have to do it with the utmost humility. But it leaves us without any excuses to go forward and be uncomfortable. It leaves us without those excuses. So he's been, he's 
in the Old Testament, he's parting water and he's using a bronze snake. In the New Testament, he's walking on water and he's using prayer shells. What's he using now? He's using you. He's calling us to get out and move. So in that, in that really honest moment, uh, maybe this is a struggle. Are you feeling stagnant in your relationship with Jesus, not sure uh, what you are to do because you feel you do have great faith in him? So then why aren't you moving mountains? Why isn't God doing the things he did in the Bible in your own life? Is it because we are not willing to be uncomfortable as the people in the Bible did that God used? Are we overlooking stepping out of the boat because we don't have the faith that we can handle the battling of the wind and the waves? Are you sitting in the boat praying, Please, Lord, remove the wind and the waves. Rather than praying, Jesus, call me out upon them. I'm not asking you to remove them. You just make me tread that under my feet. It's a whole different way to go forward. Because that is what we see in the Old and the New Testament, right? Not just a plea for it to be removed. Are we sitting in the boat Asking God to remove the wind and the waves. Or for the courage and the strength to get out and just tread on it. I think that sometimes we literally pray to avoid risks. We pray for God to make our faith not necessary. I, I, honestly, this week, if I was sitting there thinking about like, oh Lord, I think that maybe a pretty darn good percent of what I talked to you about and I requested was actually asking you to make my life a little bit easier and to remove risk and make faith pointless. And then we sit there and say, how come Jesus doesn't answer my prayers? Because look at what we're praying for. Remember when he told the 12 year old girl in the story last week and he said, Rise, little girl, the word to rise was not in the feminine singular. It meant it was a command for an army to rise and charge. Little girl. Because a little girl is an army to rise and charge. And our prayers should reflect. We should pray like an army. To rise and charge and trample the wind and the waves. Um, the, <laughs> the seventh graders uh, that I, I, I serve, I had asked them a, a series of questions. Uh, and that was one of them. <laughs> I said, okay, we, we read the story. And I had, I'm jumping ahead of myself, so then I'm going to go back and be like, oh, I'm lost in my sermon again. Oh, no. Okay. So um, I asked them, who do you think you are? Do you think that you would maybe be a Peter and jump out of the boat, or would you be a disciple in the boat? Like, where would you be? And I didn't do it as open discussion. I had the students write out it in their journals. They're more honest, right? Because <laughs> they don't have to say it publicly. And, uh, and so I asked a series of questions to them, and it was really interesting. Um, the majority of them said, honestly, I would probably be a disciple who chilled in the boat and watched the first guy go. Saw how it went, and then I would decide if I was going to go after that. Does that sound kind of right? That, that sounds about right, I think, for like a lot of us, maybe. Um, and what was really funny to me was a bunch of the kids who said, oh yeah, I'd totally jump out of the boat. They were some of the more kid, rambunctious kids that jump out of their chair in class all the time. I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> if I can't keep you in a chair, uh, how would anybody keep you in a boat, right? And I, you know, then was rephrasing some more questions with them because I thought, well, maybe... To be fair, this challenge, would you be Peter jumping out of the boat or a disciple sitting back watching how it goes? This challenge is a physical challenge, and it's a public 
challenge. Now, what if we removed those two aspects? Because the truth is, a lot of the kids who said, I don't think I would put myself out there where everybody was watching and I could fail. And I'm not really physically oriented and that's awkward and hard for me and I'm not ready for that. Uh, the truth is, I have this group of kids who are sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not a Peter. They are Peters. They are. Because when there's a new kid who shows up, they're the one who goes and makes a friend with them. When a kid at school is having a hard day, they're the ones who notice and go ask, how are you doing? Where the kids who are wild and rambunctious sometimes aren't necessarily Peters. They may jump out of the boat, but they're not picking up on where they're called to be courageous and brave and loving all the time. So not for a second would I want you to think, oh no, I'm not a Peter. You might be a Peter. If you remove uh, the fact that in this story, it's a physical public challenge. There's ways in which you follow Christ into uncomfortable situations and you're faithful to that. And you've seen God move in those moments and in those times. Everyone who moves and does a miracle of some kind of really cool thing in the Bible, they believed in a God that believed in them. That's the same God. Do you believe in a God that believes in you? And that is something we need to, um, we need to keep with. In Isaiah um, 43, starting in verse 16, it says this, I am the Lord, your Holy One the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way on the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariots and horses, armies and warriors. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished and quenched like a wicket, like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? It's hard to have a good view of what God is doing when we're just sitting in the boat. Yes, if you get out of the boat, you also have to go up against the wind and the waves. <laughs> but you have a front row seat to Jesus and what more he's doing then. And so I know that... Um, Things aren't the way it used to be. It's kind of funny because sometimes like we talk about the good old days. I talk about, um, you know, my own good old days. And uh, now everybody, you know, we have this term before COVID. <laughs> like that's a term now. Um, but we got to say, sometimes forget those things at the moment. I am doing something new. Are you in for it? Are you coming along for it? Do you realize that I am a God that believes in you? And we're going to go do something different. And it might be uncomfortable. And as a church family, we get to take comfort in that, that we're doing it together. So you may know who your Nineveh is that you need to go minister to. You may know who your enemies are that you need to love. Uh, you may know, um, you know now what, what would be uncomfortable and hard. But join Robin in serving in a new, new capacity the people in your lives that God has placed there and here as well. And I think that we're going to be more and more able to see how the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God of today, he is the same. It looks different because we're different and he is calling us out because he believes in us. And we need to tread into this week with that in the forefront of our minds. 
May this week not look the same. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you always have so many good things in store. And Lord, sometimes we miss out because we're not expecting you to change things up. And we, we pray for our, our faith to, have, to, to not be necessary, to have no point. Um, Lord, we, we want your comfort in the form of being comfortable, but Lord, you haven't called us to be that. And so, Father, may we step into this week with you, willing to lay down our comforts, to be daring, to step out of the boat where you're calling us to step out. We thank you so much for being a constant presence with us. May we realize that. We love you and thank you in your name. Amen. So, I can't wait to hear about your week next week. <laughs> I want to hear all of your out-of-the-boat experiences. Um, next week, uh, make sure you're here. Mike is going to be back and preaching for the month of September, so we get to welcome him back. Um, also, we have the barbecue and mini golf, uh, all church barbecue mini golf day coming up. It's going to be on Sunday, September 12th. So make sure you are inviting people. There are flyers in the back by the coffee um, to be inviting uh, friends and family to come to that. Join us, have a, have a burger, play mini golf, hang out. Um, and then the week after that, September 19th, we're kicking off Sunday school. So we're really excited about that. And our teachers are all excited, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So we hope to see you next week and be inviting people to come to our activities. All right. See you all.